The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. It's uh, 3 o'clock out here on the west coast of the U.S. Dr. K is with us from Cape Town, South Africa. It is late in Cape Town. Is it not, Dr. K? Where, were you at the bars, or what were you, what did you do today? Uh, traded the markets and wrote a couple of reports, and it's 1 a.m. right now. Okay. Uh, probably going to hit the bars around 5 in the morning after <laughs> we're done with all of this. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, those of you who are ready for a nap, ready for a drink, uh, I hope uh, we don't have any of that now. No sleep time and uh, no no drinks to be dispensed. Of, uh, yeah, you'll have to provide that uh, on your own. But uh, so where are we at with this market? It's kind of, uh, you know, the market that really doesn't want to come down. Okay, a lot of people were worried that there was no real reaction to the Greek uh, tragedy uh, thing. I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay. Is that true? Just shoot me a yes there on the questions. Okay, good. And everybody sees the screen just fine. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Yepers, I like that. That's unique, original. Okay. No foreign languages, though. All, all English. Okay. Um, but anyways, you can just see here the NASDAQ Composite Index is holding the 10-day line, and you got a pullback over the last couple of days, volume drying up. Uh, this bar is red because it opened up and closed lower, but you know, not too much going on. I think mostly what happens here is you get a chance to see which of your holdings are weaker, which are stronger. Uh, although I think in a lot of cases you do have to be uh, patient. But you know, what I'm trying to do is figure out where the stronger stocks are, where uh, the ones that are going to have the bigger moves are. And of course, that's easier said than done. But I think some of the action that you see when the market pulls back tells you. And there are some stocks that act constructively, uh, while others tend to flounder. And, you know, most notably, <clears throat> not sure why I have potash up here. It doesn't mean anything. You know, this is a small leading stock, stamps.com. Uh, nice breakout on the pocket pivot, and then uh, some pocket pivots off of here, but then it failed pretty quickly. So, you know, not everything is all rosy. You'll see some strong action in stock, and then it just kind of rolls over. You see a lot of that also with some of the biotechs. You know, SLX v. Salix has been kind of weak. Uh, another one that we've looked at. Uh, that is has been a viable gap up. You know, it's kind of pulling in. This does bring into play, though, something like this brings into play a possibility of buying the stock here because it is holding the low of the gap up day. And there, this is a low risk proposition here. I mean, you could blow out uh, here, maybe another couple of percent, however you want to do it. But you know, that that is a possibility. We were also looking at AVMD, which is pulled back right to the top of the base, and that probably is viable. In here, but you can see some of these stocks are weaker than others, and and you know we know today Monster has a pocket pivot. I guess this was a little bit premature, but there is something else you might know. It's kind of I don't know if this is wedging or not. You get some upside volume here, but it stalls a little bit, and then it has a pocket, so it's probably a little bit premature rather than moving tight sideways, drifting down along the 10-day, and then popping up. It kind of drops below it in here and kind of noodles around and then tries to come out. But by that time, uh, it, there's probably some sellers waiting to hit it. Then you come down below it. Now, now we had a 10% position, position bought here. Never added here because it wasn't really too sure about this. I actually did add, but quickly uh, backed away from it when it didn't really hold that well uh, in here somewhere. And then it came back in, and, and so we add back in here today. Earnings come out tomorrow. So you'll have a chance tomorrow to see how the, this reacts to this pocket pivot today. If it continues higher, I think it's probably worth holding into earnings, particularly because, or since uh, they already pre-announced. Is that right, Dr. K? Didn't they pre-announce and, and guide it higher? That's what caused the gap up down here. That, that's right, right, yeah. Yeah, so so I don't see any any uh, real problem there. You know, maybe it, it does what uh, Tractor Supply did. You know, they, they guided higher here, and then they needled around. Uh, for a while, and, and uh, earnings came out, I think, in here, when the actual earnings announcement, you know, they pre-announced here, got a gap up, and you know, earnings announcement came here as a sell the news kind of thing, I guess, and came down for a day, but then quickly recovered, and you had this big pocket pivot, which really goes nowhere, but it is holding tight right above the breakout point, so I almost tend to think this could be bought here as long as it holds, uh, you know, say the 82 level or the 80, 80 to 81 level, you know, the lows here. Uh, you could even go a little further than that and do something maybe Dr. K would do, which would be use the low of here at the 50-day moving average, depending on your own risk tolerances, okay? We always get the question, you know, what is the stop? Where is your stop? 
you know, what is the best stop to use? And the best stop to use is the one that's uh, in sync with your own uh, risk tolerance and your own psychology. Uh, I tend to run, want to run things very tight, as you all know, and so my stops will be a lot tighter. Dr. K is a little bit looser, but he runs smaller positions. So it depends on your position size, and it depends on what you can sift through. I was on the radio yesterday, and you know, I'm telling the guys, you know, I can have 10, 20 percent drawdowns, sometimes more, and it's not a freak out situation because I got deep pockets. It doesn't bother me. But someone without deep pockets would definitely have a problem with some of that. And I know from personal experience that some people who are really pikers pretending to be big investors really do freak out uh, when they get hit. So uh, so I think it's all, you know, stops are, are where you find them and where you put them in. And there are there is some logic using the 10-day moving average and the 50-day moving average along with the seven-week rule, which is a pretty good system. Uh, and, you know, support areas are logical areas to put stops in. Uh, but remember that common areas that people recognize on a chart and everybody puts their stops in, that, a lot of times that's just an area that they shake out through and then they come back up. So try to think outside the box a little bit. I think using the 10-day moving average and the 50-day moving average uh, the way we do with the seven-week rule is very unique and not something that the crowd is using. And so I think you're less likely to get in trouble with that than, say, using, uh, you know, top of a prior support level or, or something like that. So uh, the big story for us and, and where we're pretty heavily uh, invested right now on the basis of the technical action that we've seen is uh, silver and gold. And you can see here the SLV, if I get this thing to stop jumping around here. Uh, SLV, you know, one uh, big double bottom here. Actually, what you might say here, you know, let's look at something here. I think this is interesting. Uh, and this is one reason I, I was very bullish on silver. We, we got very bullish on silver coming up through the 10-week moving average, the 50-day here. And that is when you saw that pocket pivot right here that was our first buy signal. That's where we first entered the positions right there. Uh, and then you move up strongly and you go tight sideways. And then the last couple of days, you've had two pocket pivots in a row. And if you look at something here, what I think is interesting here, and the reason I think this was a low here, is you come down one wave, two waves, three waves of selling in the SLV. Now you're heading for the 40-week the, uh, or the 200-day moving average. That probably is something that's going to get through eventually. You, you saw a little bit of, of resistance here, but... You know, we're long uh, the SLV and GLD ETFs and related ETFs and leverage ETFs, whatever. And uh, they remain in play, you know. And so you're not really seeing much go on. You know, the last few uh, weeks you saw the move up sharply off the bottom and then you go sideways. And, of course, you know, that's always uh, complete, comes complete with, uh, you know, a heavy volume sell-off like right here that, of course, everybody gets concerned about. But, but really, that's kind of the nature. you got to let them go through a couple of those after they have a sharp move up. And you hold them very tightly. And on the weekly chart, you see that also. The closes are pretty tight in here. So uh, this looks pretty good. And, I, I, you know, obviously, we're adding here and getting bigger in these positions, and they're working pretty well. And I would say, in most cases, I find the, the precious metals here are more attractive as a play than the stocks because if there, there does occur – or there's any news uh, out there about uh, problems in Europe or Greece, uh, you know, having more problems in now Italy or Portugal or anybody else, and the currencies become an issue, I think there's some safety uh, in these in that regard. Dr. K, you got any comments on that? Well, essentially, um, you know, precious metals are good as long as uh, quantitative easing continues, and, you know, essentially uh, the debt gets nationalized. Um, while profits get uh, privatized, interestingly yeah. enough. Um, but that bodes well for precious metals. And uh, also we see commodities in general, uh, as represented by the Commodity Research Bureau Index, turning back around, um, oil as well. So uh, I think things are on track as concerns uh, hard assets. Yeah, and here's the DB Commodity Index. The DBC, the DBA is probably, I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing that this is coming up. Yeah, it is coming up below, but that's agriculture. Uh, oil's also broken out, and uh, I got an interesting email today, and I actually, um, and I don't know if it, it was actually to the Gilmore Report, if any of you know that, somebody sent an email in, and it was somewhat amusing, uh, because it has to be somebody who doesn't really understand an, an O'Neill ethos, and the question was, Gil, what's the best way to play the upcoming spike in oil prices uh, in the summertime, um, or the anticipated summertime spike in oil prices. So they want to know what's the best way to play the anticipated spike in oil prices 
and, and I think it's funny because they answer their own question. Uh, the first of all, anticipated. So everyone's anticipating it, and if that's the case, do they think they're the only one anticipating it? Uh, secondly, does the market discount the present so that you can pick a trade today and it's going to somehow uh, work in the summer based on some oil price spike? If you look at the, the chart of the USO, US oil fund, which mimics the uh, price of oil, which is now over $100 a barrel again. What, what did it close at? Like 100, uh, 103, somewhere around there, if that's okay. Do you remember? Yeah, we're right about uh, 106. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you got a breakout here. They're already moving. So how do you play it? Uh, gee, let's see. How do you play a movement in oil, Dr. K? Uh, let's, I think I'll buy uh, fertilizer stocks. Yeah, that's right. Or maybe I'll buy... Uh, Sugar futures. Now, if you're going to play a move in oil, you're going to buy the oil ETF, or you can buy oil stocks. But I just thought it was funny that somebody thinks that, because they probably heard something on TV about the spike in summer oil prices, how do you play it? It's like, eh, how do you play it? It's like, that's not something O'Neill would think about. You, you look at the price volume action of whatever's going on in the market in real time, and that's telling you what's going to happen down the line. So it's discounting the future. So if there is going to be a spike in summer oil prices, my guess is it's already telling you that now, and you see that in a lot of the oil stocks. Uh, Continental Resources is one we followed, and you notice it's getting a little bit more uh, upside volume and starting to move. You know, but there were pocket pivots we pointed out along the way. It's still very jagged, and of course, you know, Dr. K and I will probably end up looking stupid when this is all uh, done and said with, or said and done, because we talk about how we don't really like oils because their trends are generally uneven and, and not since really 1997 in our careers have we ever seen a real smooth trend in oil stocks. So we'll probably get one here. And uh, a lot of these look okay. You know, I was even looking at this little tiny one, Energy XXI, <clears throat> whatever that is, I guess Energy 21. Uh, you know, big breakout here on huge volume, and now you're getting these little pocket pivots off the 10-day moving average, and this is kind of interesting. They got strong earnings uh, and sales. Uh, last quarter, they uh, up 106%, and the quarter before that, uh, before that up 2,000% on a uh, absolute basis because that was going against a negative number. But you're seeing that, and I, I'm going to guess, okay, just pulling these up, that Exxon is looking okay. And I'm going to guess that uh, Chevron, does Chevron still exist? No. What are some of the, uh, is, uh, let's see, some of the other big oils. Ah, here we go. Oil service, Halliburton coming off the lows. So, I mean, you, you see a lot of the stocks in the oil patch um, acting well. I wonder even if old rig is coming up. Yeah, it's trying to come off the lows. But you can see the leaders are things like CLR, Concho Resources, and these guys are into BRAC fracking as well. And I guess there's a new study that came out that showed that fracking is not as uh, polluting to the water table as uh, people thought. But in any case, <clears throat> that's what you're saying. Oil looks good. So if you want to play oil, it's happening now. There's nothing to think about come summertime. So that's acting well. Um, let's see. What other things uh, are we looking at? Let's look at LinkedIn. Uh, I think LinkedIn's still okay. It just uh, you're not going to get through this breakout here through 95 because, number one, it's probably too obvious. Number two, the whole world uh, is trying to short LinkedIn right now because it is it is wildly overvalued. You all know that, right? Um, that's why it gapped up here on the basis of being overvalued, I'm sure. But, you know, this is a sharp move off the lows, and you pick up some volume. Notice, so it's not volume here that's necessarily heavier than any of the updates. This was a little bigger, but it held tight after the big gap up day. <clears throat> and it's kind of LinkedIn's nature to drift in a bit after a move up. You know, it did this, and, and a little, so it's kind of its nature. So I think if it holds, Dr. K, what would you say? Um, we own LinkedIn, of course, and it's a nice position. We got aggressive in here. It didn't pan out. We bailed out, and then watching it come in today uh, with the volume drying up, we're nibbling back and taking our position back. Uh, and actually, that this works in our favor. It puts us in a much better position with respect to our cost basis in terms of handling a further pullback, which could occur down to the 10-day, maybe even further. But I think if this is going to work, it's going to hang out in here pretty well. Dr. Candy, take on that? Yeah, I mean, it looks, again, it looks, uh, that gap up, uh, Bible gap up we saw on the 10th of February is very strong in the pattern. Uh, that was due to a strong earnings report. So the stock looks to me like it, um, it should go higher from here. It certainly, uh, you know, if you got, a, if anyone has a position in it, um, you know, sit tight. It might give you a bit of a wild, wild ride, but um, for now, it looks, it looks fine to me. <coughs> Fundamental yeah. there as well. 
and you have to keep in mind here, you know, you're coming off, and the way I see this pattern too is it does have three selling waves in it, one, two, three, and this doesn't take you to new lows, but you do have three waves of selling, so it seems to me uh, that with this dry up down along the lows here, and it holds tight in here, that anybody's going to sell a stock is pretty much out there, and then you see every week here, it closes at the peak, and we've talked about how this is similar to Amazon back in 2003, but, you know, Amazon did that coming up the right side of a base, and then it just drifted back and held tight for the next four weeks before launching again, and it gave some time for the 10-week to catch up. It's possible that LinkedIn could do that, uh, but, you know, I'm thinking with something like 8 million shares, and we'll find out how much uh, is short, uh, how much LinkedIn stock has been short uh, as of the end of February, soon enough by next week when we get the new numbers, the new reports. Uh, but I think if you still have that amount of short interest in the stock, it may come out here faster rather than slower. Uh, because it's only so, at this point, there's only, only so much stock that the shorts can borrow. So unless you have natural sellers, uh, then I don't think you're really going to have any problem. So, but it could go sideways. But, you know, consider something else. Um, a stock that we looked at a while ago when it was coming up through the 50-day moving average was this um, CF Industries, the fertilizer stock. Coming up here, this is a pocket pivot. And I think we talked about it in one of these webinars when it occurred. And you can see it ran up. But see, like, similarly to LinkedIn, it runs into this middle peak here. And it runs into it and backs up a couple of times before it moves to highs. You know, pulls back on top of it. And now it's going back up to highs. So LinkedIn may have to do something like that if you figure that's the middle point on, on CF, and that's what it had to do. Now we're at the middle point here on uh, LinkedIn. So kind of just gauge, you know, that action could, could do a little bit of this in here. So sort of try to acclimate yourself uh, to that. You know, one of the things you can do is uh, you can take a chart and print it out and then take a pencil or whatever, a pen, or whatever else you like to draw with, and... Uh, Draw, you know, what if the stock breaks down to here? What are you going to do? And what if it uh, just goes sideways? What if it breaks, turns, and goes to high? What are you going to do? You know, so you could come up with different movements and then ask yourself what you would do in response. This is kind of useful because what it does is it forces you to think about something before it happens. Uh, it, it's just like, you know, before you buy a stock, you better decide where your stop is, wherever that happens to be. You decide how much you're willing to lose on the trade. And, uh, and operate from there. <clears throat> so you want to get yourself acclimated to what it could do. And then when it, when it happens, then you just react according to your plan rather than reacting to an emotion and, uh, you know, or the, the hot feeling on your face or whatever you get when you see something that you own suddenly drop or pull back. Uh, you're not operating on that basis. You're operating on the basis of a preconceived plan, okay? And that's really how you want to be operating. Uh, my view, so for example, yesterday I was trying to get very heavy uh, in LinkedIn and going 200% long in one account <clears throat> as it was coming up there. And, and so what I'm doing is I'm looking for this thing to uh, punch through and the volume to hold up for the thing to punch through. If it doesn't, I just back off, go back down to a core position, let it come in and then start adding back in here and try to work it out again. But I have an idea of what I'm going to do and I stick to it. And the idea is that if it breaks through 95 and holds, I'm in big. If it doesn't hold on that breakout, I'm going to back it down fast. And that's my plan. So I stick to the plan. And now my, my plan now is letting it come in. The volume dries up. I'm going to try and accumulate some in here and add to my position if I have a lower cost basis down here you know, without letting myself get top heavy. And so you also want to set you know, ideas of how, how much you're going to let something that you add. So let's say you bought here and now you're adding in here. You know, how much are you going to let yourself get underwater on this as it pulls back? And I would say, you know, Stick to a certain percentage and then operate that way. And then just wait for the next opportunity in the stock uh, and the clear buy signal to come in before uh, acting again. And just wait for that to happen. So for me, after doing this, the light volume pulling in right in top of this 90 area, which is also right on top of this little flag type thing that it formed very quickly, this little U-shaped flag, that seems reasonable. It could pull back a little bit more. But if I'm buying in at under 90 and buying it back today, uh, 87 is a 10-day, you know, that's a buck or two lower, big deal, a couple, couple, two and a half, three percent, I guess. So not a problem, okay? Um, let's go through some more uh, names. I want to check some stuff here. Let's look at uh, Envision. Uh, Envision needs to form its first base, so I think you got to let it. If you still own it, if you bought it down here and you're, you're still owning it and you want to hold it, no problem with that. It's just building a base. Dr. K, you have a position in this still? Are you holding it? Yeah, I do. 
Yeah, so you're just, you know, you got your move and you got your scale position, what you can sit with now, and you're waiting for the next base. And that may be, you know, five weeks from now, it, maybe it forms a little three weeks pattern. Maybe you see some continuation pocket come off, continuation pocket pivot, buy point coming off the 10 day moving average, and you could add again. Um, what are you looking for to add, Dr. K? I'm looking for a pocket pivot. Yeah. So I had this too, and I sold it up here. Um, and I'm looking, just waiting to see when it, it uh, sets up again. Um, I have talked about how it reminds me, at least from my own visceral experience, it reminds me of MRV Communications back in 1994, and I was buying that stuck around $8. And it was similar, if you go back and look at the pattern, it had pocket pivots coming out at 8 bucks and breaks out. I, I was buying it then, and uh, <clears throat> I went out to visit the company out in Chatsworth, uh, out here in the valley, so-called valley. Uh, and and uh, I bought stock and it doubled real quickly and went up through 10 and uh, hit, hit about 17, I think it was, before it went sideways. And I remember continually trying to add to my position at 17 because I was so, so excited that it doubled my money so quickly and just kept trying to buy it and buy it. And I just kept getting beaten back, beaten back. And what I should have realized, you know, after something doubles or goes up 70%, it needs some time to rest and, and build a base. And so what I should have done is just hold my first position that I doubled my money in and just wait for the next base to form and give it some time rather than trying to average up when I didn't have a buy point. Of course, that was 1994 and I'd only been doing this for about three years. But in this case, I can kind of get a sense that yeah, it's probably hit a short-term top and needs to base. And now I'm just waiting for the next buy signal. Dr. K, on the other hand, is still holding his initial position, which is fine. My position is probably a lot bigger. Um, so I'm going to run it tighter, but you know he's working it fine, and that's what you can do. So there are different ways to skin a cat. Uh, and we're two weeks down in the base. This is the weekly chart, and so for now, it's just you know, it probably needs to go sideways. And I, you know you want to see it tighten up. And I would love to see it form a five, six week base and then go higher. I think you would have another sharp move off of there. I definitely think this is a stock you need to keep your eye on because I think the concept, as I said before is similar to what happened with Omnivision Technologies in the early 2000s. I think it was 2003 when it had its price move. They made uh, chips for cameras that were used on smartphones, and uh, now you see them. They're ubiquitous on laptops now uh, and, and smartphones. So, you know, back then, that whole growth curve uh, as the technology of uh, telephones or phones uh, having... Uh, cameras on them grew and became standard issue. Uh, I think you're going to see the same thing with InventSense with respect to motion sensor chips. So uh, <clears throat> I see it as a similar phenomenon, and they'll they'll capitalize on the broadening out into uh, the broadening out of motion sensor technology into various devices because just getting started. And as one, I was talking to a guy, a very smart guy, uh, yesterday. He's an O'Neill-oriented uh, analyst. He works for Thinkorswim. He's a guy named Mark McKechnie. Uh, very sharp guy. His brother Dennis used to run the PIMCO Technology Fund back in the late 90s. I think he ran it from like 97 to 2000 and retired, you know, pretty wealthy. Uh, and Mark, his younger brother, uh, I met when he was running a hedge fund for a period of time. But Mark does better, I think, as an analyst, very sharp. But he, he says this is a strong situation because their only competition uh, is uh, our French companies. And so, you know, hands down right there, they win. <clears throat> I was happy to see that. Anyways, <clears throat> let's go through some more names. I noticed a little pocket pivot uh, today in uh, AG coming in through here. Uh, First Majestic Silver. First Majestic Silver has been building a big base. You'll notice this is sort of a cup, and here's a little handle. I would keep an eye on these because with silver moving, these look good. But my preference is to play uh, so the SLV and the GLD, uh, again, the miners tend to be choppy affairs, a lot like oil stocks, which means, you know, if we keep saying that, they're probably going to start trending. But you can see here you get a pocket pivot here coming up off the 10-day, the gapping up off the 10-day uh, and the 20-day, actually, too. And that follows up with another one as you're breaking out through this range. Now, this is not a pocket pivot because you're extended from the 10-day moving average, but it is breaking out. So it validates this breakout from this little range. Um, but you'll notice Cordeline, another silver miner, it's in a weaker pattern. Some might notice the reverse head and shoulders. I don't know if that's valid. But you might say this is a little cup with handle here because you do have 35% uh, rally off the low here. So this would be a kind of a cup with handle formation here. You pull back, volume dries up, and now you're trying to come out. So I don't know if this clears this level. It may be able to come up the right side. But I notice that among these, uh, First Majestic seems to be a little tighter a little bit better, 
but again, you know, we're we're playing the metals move uh, with the SL well SLV and the GLD and their their uh, leveraged derivatives, or like the BGP and the AGQ. So um, let's see, going through a few others. Um, you know, we we uh, had a position Biogen. And uh, it's the, the thing that bothers me about Biogen here is, is this is a big stock. It has been. It's had a pretty big move, and it's basically on the come in terms of their uh, their their new drug for MS and uh, multiple sclerosis. And there are a number of other companies. QuestCore is another one with a drug for multiple sclerosis. And uh, you know, a lot of it's on the come. So it, it the earnings aren't really there. You had six percent growth in the most recent quarter, and so it's a little bit slow. And we debate debated this one, but here's what I don't like about it: is that once you got you broke out, you had no follow through on the breakout, and then since then you've really seen less upside volume than you have selling, and now you're sitting right on top of the 50-day. So it really needs to come off the 50-day. But I'm thinking if I was going to be in a biotech, you know, maybe something like an ABMD coming in on the pullback here, and after hours I noticed QuestCore. Uh, came out with their earnings, Qcore, uh, where is it? I thought I saw it trading after hours. 36.55 bid after hours, so that's pumping up to about here. And that'll probably come up to the 10-day, so that'll be an underwater pocket pivot. It's under the 50-day. It's above the 200-day. But this may be the lows of a base. That's a possibility. We've been waiting for this to, to happen. But, you know, it was a big mover, and so here you come. This is actually pretty constructive coming down, so I can see it rounding out maybe a cup of handle. Um, so, but but the biotechs have been a bit uneven. Biopharma. Uh, <clears throat> what I don't like about this stock is it acts well, it acts well, and then crack, and it acts well, crack, and and now today you're closing beneath the 10-day moving average, and I would use the 10-day moving average as a selling guide. Uh, I don't really care for this today. We'll see what it does tomorrow. They come out with earnings next week. I know Portfolio Simulator dude thought that it's uh, tomorrow, but it doesn't really matter. The, the basis is he has a decent profit, but he's a little bit nervous about it. And it is kind of in an extended position. Um, we'll just see what happens. If you own it, you can wait for it to violate this to sell it. But uh, we backed away from it today. There's always a possibility we could buy it back. We don't have a problem with... Uh, buying back things if they show strength after we sold them and if we possibly sold them prematurely. So that's one thing you also need to understand in the markets is that you want to be flexible and if you do uh, sell something that looks weak one day and it starts to firm up, then you can always come back uh, and buy it back. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, COP. Everybody's asking about COP. What's COP? COP. What is this? Conoco Phillips. Okay, big oil stock. People probably didn't know what I'm asking for. CVX is Chev Chevron. Yeah. So getting back to oil, it's acting okay. But you can see the ones uh, that are acting well uh, are the things like CLR, the things that are going. <clears throat> Let's see here. Priceline breaking out. You know, there's not much to say here. Announcing earnings tomorrow. Is that right, Dr. K? Yeah. And so we'll see what happens there. Totally Cat, what's that? It's tomorrow, right? Uh, Caterpillar is acting well, also. You know, Cat Caterpillar is a big sto uh, stuff stock. I know this Joy Global is getting whacked the other day. Now it's making a comeback. Uh, big volume move today. If you use a 20 days of pocket pivot indicator, I guess that would be a pocket pivot. But it's kind of V-shaped uh, in any case. But you know, these stocks for the most part are acting pretty well. Uh, let's see. Somebody keeps saying still no audio. Everybody else can hear me fine. So uh, I'm not sure what the problem is. It's probably on your end. Uh, Lulu is one we probably should look at. I, Lulu kind of bothers me because, again, you close below the 10-day and now you violate it here. And I think you have followed it for seven weeks. So I, I don't know. It's, it's pretty well known, but everyone's shorted here. Who knows? Uh, it's acting okay, but I'd watch this. <clears throat> I'd like to see it get back above the 10-day moving average. Uh, I think we pointed out this one, Transdime. I'm not sure at some point, maybe on a pocket here. Did we, Dr. K? Did we talk about this one at one point? Yeah, we did. Yeah, and so this one's acting well. It's trying to come off the 10-day. It's doing pretty well. Um, <clears throat> CF, we already looked at that. Tibco, uh, you know, it's coming up the right side. Now, it, what it's doing here is this is a cup with a handle now. And you can definitely see here's a cup, here's a handle. and It's, it's tightening up in here. 
And this action in here, these closes along in here are a lot tighter than anything you've seen in the pattern, uh, probably since down in here. So <clears throat> this looks like, uh, I guess you could say this is a reverse head and shoulders. We don't really pay attention to that, but you do have three ways of selling in the pattern. It's tightening up in here. What I'd be watching for here is a pocket pivot up through the 10-day moving average, uh, which is always a possibility here, I think. <clears throat> F5 had a pocket pivot. We put out a report at the close, roughly a little after. Just barely, very subtle. Uh, portfolio simulator dude is bidding for the stock after hours, but nobody's uh, hitting him. He's trying to buy back his position. But F5 acts okay. F5 is allied with RAX. Um, we had bought a position on the gap up and sold on the violation of this move here, but we may come back into it. The only thing is there's no real volume on the bounce, so it may just need to form a little flag. My guess is it'll issue another uh, buy point in here if uh, one really wants to buy the stock. But see, that's an example. If you set a stop, you can get shaken out in the short term, but you don't really know what this thing is going to do because you didn't get a lot of volume. But I do think because they're in bed with RAX uh, or, or F5 and VMware as well, as long as you see all these stocks acting reasonably well, they're probably okay. Now, they may not all take off. F5, if you bought the viable gap up here, you know, you're probably falling asleep if you still own it. But the stock may be showing some signs of starting to want to move higher. You know, it has trended higher and it's still holding the 10-day moving average. So uh, it looks okay. Do I see a, a head and shoulders in Baidu? No, I don't. Because you, to have a head and shoulders, well, let's see. Uh, you know, I don't, this is, on a, you could say it's a big head and shoulders. Stock doesn't really want to break down, though. That's the problem. It's a big stock. And today you... See some volume come in here above average volume and holds back above the 200-day moving average after selling off after earnings. So I, I wouldn't be shorting anything here because you're not really in a bear trend yet. Uh, there are some things that might be brewing up, like Amazon, for example. And I, you know, I, I keep trying to short this thing, and I, I made a little bit of money shorting on these breaks, but it doesn't really seem to give you anything big. Uh, I was messing around with it today, but it's not, it doesn't really want to break down. It's still below its 50-day moving average. You can see that here. And this is turning into a big head and shoulders. You have this little small head and shoulders, this compact head and shoulders right here. You see that? And you have the big break. The big volume break is the right side of this little head. This is kind of a pin head with pin shoulders type of formation. But now you can see that it's kind of broadened out and filled out into a bigger head and shoulders where you have a big head right here. And then you have a left shoulder here. And then you're forming a right shoulder, right shoulder. Heavy volume, you can either look at this as support off the lows or stalling action on the rally attempts above the 50-day, and now it's below. I think it's probably weak, but the other thing you have to be open to is that if the market continues higher, Amazon being a big stock, and if you look at Amazon going down the line in the next few years, they do have big earnings coming. So there is a point at which a value-oriented manager, believe it or not, uh, even without uh, Amazon selling out, I think, 114 times so. Uh, forward uh, estimates right now, 12-month forward estimates, is that right? 138 times uh, forward earnings estimates. I still think there are value-oriented managers who are long-term who might look at it uh, in terms of having some value if it comes down, because right now you're selling at 36 times 2014 earnings of $5.02, and by 2016, Amazon expected to earn $9. So it's not clear to me as the premier e-commerce uh, leader with potential to capitalize on the cloud uh, and to capitalize on the next wave of where the internet's going with streaming uh, movies and whatnot and leverage their their uh, base of their customer base. I don't think you can really count them out because they are a major player in what's going to become the new wave of the cloud. So, uh, and, and I think it's one company positioned well in terms of their overall business. Whether they execute it or not will show up in the chart. But I wouldn't assume that this is going to break down if the market doesn't. You can test it, and but you better use a stop in here. You know, I don't know if you want a, a short one at the 50-day or the 10-week here, the blue line, or you can do a long one at the top. Uh, but but I wouldn't assume anything here as far as any shorts go. Um, <clears throat> I saw the Vivas news. Um, I mean, it's, okay, it's going to have a big gap up tomorrow because it's trading at like 21 after hours, less I saw. So you're going to be up here. Let's see what this looks like. I want to see where this thing is overall in its pattern. Whoops. Whoa. Okay, there we go. Well, it's going to gap out of this big base and open at 20, 21 bucks. Hey, Dr. K, uh, looking at this pattern, you're still awake? You're still awake, aren't you? 
Yeah. Gone up to bed yet? Okay. Look at this pen. You're going to open up tomorrow at whoa up here at 21 bucks. Uh, would you buy this as a buyable gap up if it uh, puts up a discernible low? Well, it depends on the range of the day. Um, I mean, it is it is a biotech. Well, it's a medical company, and therefore it's subject to uh, gap up and gap downs. Um, I have to wait and see what happens and how it trades tomorrow. But I don't. I mean. 21. That's I mean, a huge gap. That's it's, a double. Double, it's a double play here, so yeah. um, I'd have to I'd have to wait and see. It's gonna. My thinking is that with that kind of a hundred, you know, it's a hundred percent, almost hundred percent gain overnight, and so it's, it's going to probably be a bit too uh, post potentially too probably much too risk. Much. Yeah, you'll probably have people sell it down. Maybe maybe it retraces half of the gap. I don't know, but we'll see. I don't know. Some they have some new obesity drugs, so. Now, I think you'd put every obesity drug out of business if uh, people just gave up gluten. So, as you all know, I'm on a, uh, I found out I'm allergic to wheat a couple of months ago and stopped eating wheat. And uh, I notice in so many ways I feel much better, but steadily losing weight. And uh, so I don't know. You know, if people just ate right, you wouldn't need an obesity drug unless people have problems with their, with their uh, thyroid or some other bi biology uh, that's causing them to be uh, fatter than the average bear. <clears throat> In any case, for now, I'm just satisfied to eat right. <clears throat> cores, uh, people ask about cores, just holding the gap up. That's all, not much. I mean, uh, it's a gap up from an extended position, but <clears throat> it, it's probably going to need to go sideways and uh, form a, a, a base, but it should hold the low here. That's about it. CDNS, Cadence uh, Software, whatever it's, what it's Cadence Design Systems. You know, there's a pocket pivot in here. It doesn't really act well, but remember, it's a $12 stock, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. We'll we'll point out pocket pivots when they occur, uh, but you know, you have to look at things in terms of quality, and it's okay. Futures volume was heavy in gold. And Silver's Futures yesterday issuing pocket pits, no pocket pivot in gold. Should we follow Futures or ETF volume? Uh, you know, you can use either, but I think if you saw, we tend to look at gold and silver as tracking together. So if silver has a pocket pivot, then we'll buy the gold too, but we want to see the gold kind of confirm. And today you saw the GLD confirm with its own pocket pivot coming on the heels of, because uh, this is a pocket pivot, I believe, today. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this is a pocket pivot today. Uh, it's a breakout, though. It's not. It's a little bit extended, but you want to see it confirm with similarly uh, strong action, like you see with the SLB, where you get two pocket pivots in a row. So SLB had a pocket pivot. We're on, we're buying ourselves on that basis. Uh, you know, portfolio simulator. He's a little slow in the uptake. Uh, and, you know, I want to emphasize something else. Is that portfolio simulator dude does not represent what we do. We're trying to create a character that is a composite based on a lot of the emails that we get and a lot of the different personality types who, who have all their weird little concerns and the weird little quirks that they do when they get shaken out. And so we're just trying to create a composite character and then have him go through, you know, actual uh, working through a building a portfolio buying stocks with the usual sort of trepidations that we see coming from people. And just to show you how, you know, the average Joe who screws up a lot might handle things, okay? Everybody wants to treat it like it's some sort of buy this here, sell this there, buy this there, sell this here. It, it, that's not what it is. It's just to illustrate how one might work through it. And then you can apply it and, and it may, maybe take some comfort or understand that everybody screws up, we screw up. Uh, and then you'll see how Portfolio Simulator Dude tries to be somewhat flexible and uh, remain somewhat rules-based, despite the fact that, you know, he gets scared out of things, like he got scared out of F5 today. Um, he took a decent profit in Viral Pharma, but we'll see how that pans out. But meanwhile, he's got some good positions in the silver and gold ETFs and LinkedIn as well, and we'll see if something else pops up uh, in the next few days. So, but, you know, and, and we also do get a lot of people telling us that we need to have a portfolio simulator who trades more like we do, so you can all see what we do. But I want you to think about this in terms of, of more practical uh, sense for us is like I'm not the way I trade I'm not going to sit there putting out emails every 10 15 minutes if when I'm putting on a new trade or maybe backing away from it later on you know it's like I'm going to be so busy typing my fingers are going to develop some sort of arthritic sort of shriveling uh, malady I don't know but but uh, you know so that's not going to happen just so you all know 
because uh, it doesn't make sense. You know, what do we get? What is this going to do for us? All it's going to do is get in the way, and then we got to be telling everybody, trade this then and that, that now, you know. And sometimes I don't think people could deal with it anyway. So it ain't going to happen. You're going to have to figure out how to do it on your own. And Portfolio Simulator Dude, as he is configured now, as a composite of all of you, uh, is going to remain what he is. Is Netflix shortable on today's gap down? Well, I actually shorted it this morning. And then it came down and it undercut these lows. And then I noticed it didn't want to go down anymore, so I turned around and bought it. Made a couple bucks, but not much more. But I don't know. I don't think I shorted here. It's in an uptrend. It's coming down. I found some support you know, at this low. Uh, everybody wants to short it. It could go to the 200 day, and then maybe it's a short. But you know, to me, this one, the heart is out of the watermelon on this puppy. This thing, you know, we told you about it here when it topped a long time ago. So that was really the, the place to be short. And of course, everybody sees that and they want to short every rally, but you're not really seeing huge amounts of selling. There's been news of Comcast coming into streaming uh, movies and yeah, everybody's going to do it. So Netflix probably eventually is a $10 stock, right? At least that seems to be the story. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm not interested in shorting it necessarily. I did try to gap to see if it would break. I did not get a sense that there are a lot of sellers that seem to run out, and then the thing just ends up with a bunch of shorts, and then it starts to drift back up. Uh, we'll see what happens, but I'm not shorting it, Dave. So just uh, uh, how much weight so far? Uh, 13.5 pounds. So I'm at 180 uh, down from 193.5. And at one point, when I worked for O'Neill, I weighed uh, 210 pounds, I'm sad to say. And that's fat for me. But it's not like I'm a skinny guy to begin with. Dr. K is. Dr. K can whiff down two prime ribs, two 24-ounce prime ribs, and three lobsters, and he wouldn't gain a pound. He burns it all off, I think. Right, Dr. K? At Kokomo in Vegas, that was great. That was quite yeah. a feast. Yeah. Uh, forgive me if this effect is it, but is the rule for a violation of a gap up in the S4? Well... Dr. K, here's a question for you. When you're looking at a gap up, so let's just take let's take Buffalo Wild Wings. I like this gap up. I think we told you guys about this one. Uh, is the rule for a violation of the moving average the same as for a viable gap up? In other words, does it have to close below this low and then move below the low of that low, uh, you know, the intraday low of that day where it closes below here, just like with a moving average, or is it different? <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's intraday. So if, if if your stock violates the low of that gap up day, uh -huh. and I usually allow one to two percent for um, flexibility right. under that low, then I'm going to sell it intraday. I don't wait till the close. But you can also play it the other way. You can wait for the close to see where your stock is going to close. In other words, if it doesn't close below the low, then you can sit tight with that position. I just prefer to be a little bit more. Um, quick in my selling if uh, if that low is violated. Right, because you can always that come back in. Right, so um, fire. Was fire a viable gap up? Source fire? Well, that's a viable gap up, so uh, do, do, let's see. Oh, that's pretty good. That stock, boy, where's this stock been? This thing's been sleeping for a long time, but I guess that would be a viable gap up, but you're way down here, so you're almost 10% lower, so there's a lot of risk in there, you know. That's the problem. We didn't pick it up, and probably because, I'm going to guess, last quarter's earnings were 6%, so that wouldn't even show up in most of my screens. It would be it would be dumped out because of uh, uh, fundamentals, but you got this viable gap. But, you know, I'd watch how this pans out. If it came back in and tested that low and got closer to that 40, what is that low there? It appears to be uh, 41.15. 41.15. Yeah, if it came, and I might be interested. That's a, it's a great, great story. I like this uh uh, company I've liked them for for a while. The other one is Fortinet. I think there's security. Yeah, Fire and Fortinet's another one, and it's actually you know keep an eye on this because it's trying to set up, and it's hanging out. I don't. I think they came out with earnings. Uh, they came out with earnings already. So no, they had a little viable gap up actually right here. So, you know, I guess if you wanted to buy this one, it probably will move with that. The two are both uh, computer software security companies. So, what you could do with something like Fire, what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch to see. If it comes back, if it retraces constructively, say back down toward uh, 42, 42 or 43, uh, then I might pick up some shares because then yeah. it's closer to that low of the back bubble gap update. Yeah, that's how you would handle that. So be you know, but be patient and pick your spot. 
Uh, and because you can see that, you know, I, I get all, all excited and I get a big woody for, uh, well, did I just say that? Um, you know, for, for LinkedIn here, and, you know, I probably would be better off buying here and hanging out, buying here, hanging out, and letting this thing buying again. Uh, you know, it probably pays not to get all excited and to kind of be patient and work your plan. So PCYC it doesn't really show up on my, uh, somebody's asking about that. By the way, we do, this is the only forum where we do answer questions on stocks that we aren't putting reports on. I know there are some people out there who like to email us all the time about every single stock in the market, like we're their email buddies, and we want to talk about the market with them all day via email, which is really not true because we just don't have enough time for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, we would ask that people, if, if, you, if there's an answer in the facts section to your question, rather than emailing us, if you can find it there, that would be helpful because we get a lot of emails. And if it's redundant stuff or just silly stuff, uh, it, it's wasting our time. So please think about that. Notice I'm being nice today. Why is that? I guess I like the moves in silver and gold. Uh, make me happy. I surge. I love I surge. I think it's going higher. Uh, I think you buy it right here. I think you're going to have a pocket pivot tomorrow off the 10-day moving average. How's that? So you did have one here, just a little bit above the 10-day moving average. But it's above 500 now, so you could buy it on the basis of the Livermore Century Mark rule. Uh, but I think it looks fine. And I think I surge, you know, with the situation in Japan now, that the Ministry of Health in Japan is going to be reimbursing them for uh, prostate procedures using the Da Vinci robot, robotic surgery system. Um, I think it's going higher. And it's one of the big leading stocks, and I like it. Uh, IACI, you can see this one. If you're using the low on the gap up here, it shook out. But, you know, IACI is kind of a sloppy stock. Uh, and, you know, it's never really had uh, any big moves. And I know that the guy, who's the guy? He started uh, QVC or whatever. Uh, what's the guy's name? Who Barry Diller. Barry yeah, Diller. Barry, Barry Diller. You see Barry in, in Beverly Hills sometimes. When I used to work there, you'd see him. Century City. Uh, but, you know, Barry would always go on CNBC and lament the fact that his company, Interactive Corp., had more money-earning web-based uh, business lines than any other company, and they're, you know, they're valued at, at, I don't know, what's the P right now? 50 times estimates. Well, now they're starting to get a, a nice big P, but, you know, back then they'd be valued like 15 times estimates while things like Amazon and everything else were going nuts and Netflix, and he always felt that they had more content. But it's a slow stock. Tell you the truth, it bores me to tears. We're on the solid buy signal. What is the criteria for selling that? I don't know. I don't understand. Why would you sell it? There is no criteria for selling a buy signal. Okay, maybe you could could clarify that. Save. I hate this stock now. Okay, we got shaken out of our shaken out of our position. I was actually buying this thing in here. It ran up, held nice the whole way. They come out with earnings and blow me out here. You know, just above 17 because we're dropping in, and I only let it go couple percent below the 10-day if it's starting to really break. And, of course, what happens? It bounces off the 50-day and then turns around and gets back above the 10-day uh, moving average. So if you look at this on a weekly chart, it looks very strong, okay? But because uh, you see these big volume spikes here and it closes up at the peak. So it's probably going higher. And so I would not be averse to buying it back here if it gave me I don't know. You could see this is a nice big supporting week, but I, I really don't like that. And I don't like being in stocks that do that kind of stuff. Uh, nevertheless, if you're able to handle maybe a smaller position, you can deal with this. I, it's acting okay now, but I didn't really care for that flip out. Um, Jazz has that same sort of tendency to flip out. And of course, it's acting well, and on Friday, it suddenly spun out of control in the middle of the day. I never saw the news on that. I know they're coming out with earnings this week, I think, or next week. Uh, but I, I'm thinking there's better stocks to play. I, I don't really care much for that. You got any take on this, Dr. K? Well, Jazz spun out before, and that uh, that's a very big defect in the pattern because of the way the markets are made in the stock. And then since it spun out once, it can sp spin out again. Um, and so this the action on save uh, pretty much uh, takes it out of um, contention because it did that. And there are other stocks that don't do that. Most stocks don't it's been out of control like that, and I'd rather have my money uh, more safely in such names. Right. And if you like big, fat, safe names, MasterCard's a good one. You know, I, I think uh, you had this breakout through here, and it remained within viable range. You know, it, theoretically, uh, you can buy them as long as they remain within 5% of the breakout point. 
Hey, Dr. K, is that based on any statistical work, or is that just something that got pulled out of someone's, uh, well, you know, that someone which, just Which one? That, which the which point? That, that, that stocks, once stocks break out, as long as they're within 5% of the breakout point, they're still viable. What is that based on? Is there a study that that's based on, or is that just pulled out? No, I think, I think that's just, that's, my understanding is that's always just based on um, the general risk-reward um, level of people. In other words, as long as it's not 5% past the buy point, it, it's not considered extended. But I would, I would say that uh, you should base it not on the absolute percentage, but based on the ATR of the stock. The average true range of the stock, yeah. So Right. So, I mean, in other words, a very calm stock, 3% or 4% might be uh, considered extended. But a very right. volatile stock, there's stocks I bought in the past that were 7% extended, and they were not extended relative to the pattern. And these are the types right. of names, you know, if you buy something 7% extended, the stock better, you know, you, you better have a, enough volatility in the pattern that you can realize 20 or 30% gain pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, do you stay long with a position overnight if you're heavily into it, 100%, 200%? Yeah, if, if I'm up on it. Um, AUY is a miner someone's asking about. So like I said, we do answer questions about stocks in this particular forum. Uh, I'm going to talk to Dr. K later on about the possibility of having uh, a blog, just a, a private blog for webinar uh, members so that we can all blog together. And if you guys have uh, questions about stocks, you can blog us. Uh, and, and uh, we can answer that way, but I'll, I'll talk to Dr. K about that. That's one thing I'm thinking about adding to the webinar service is a private blog, um, which I think would be helpful. Uh, AUY, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Not, nah, it's kind of V-shaped. I don't really like this, and I prefer AG. Um, AG is actually, my, of all the miners, my favorite. Uh, it, it seems to act a little bit. I also think silver is going to have a bigger move here, but the other ones are you know, acting okay. But again, Let's get back to the idea that you don't need the miners to play a move in precious metals. All you need are the precious metals. So, you know, what's the problem? We don't. I think when you get into miners with the price of oil going up, you have issues with their cost structure. So, so Dave, you did the same thing I did in Netflix. Good man. So you flipped around and went long. So, you know, I was thinking about holding it overnight, but. Because I, I think they might squeeze, squeeze them up to 120, but I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I'll just go back to uh, <clears throat> my stocks. I'll go back to my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn security blanket. Uh, I have noticed STX moving up. What is STX? C8. Um, well, that's technically a viable gap up. What kind of pattern are we in? It looks not too bad. There, I mean, there's a lot of these in, uh, I think, in this area, you know, networkers, the Seagate is a hard, a hard drives, right? Uh, in fact, I'm one of the guys who was one of the first people who worked there. Uh, he used to live in his car in the parking lot, sleep in his car in the parking lot when Seagate was first starting. And then later on went to re uh, start his own company, which he then sold to Japanese consortium, and now he lives on the beach in Santa Cruz. So um, That's Peter, you know, Chris. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, it's acting okay. Looks fine. Viable gap up, and uh, it's tightened up. Looks okay. Just watch for the next buy point. I don't know if there's a story about it. I don't really pay attention to stories. Uh, I'm not really paying attention to when. There's some news that one of the partners is being forced out, and they're kind of debating over how they're going to dispose of his stake or whether he has to dispose of his stake. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not a buyer of when, although you could consider that a bottom fishing pocket pivot, I guess. But... Uh, there, it's too erratic in here. I don't really like this. But you do have one, two, three waves of selling. You know, maybe it is going to start to work its way around. So, it's a possibility. Uh, you know, in terms of being able to turn around. But I, I think there are other stocks I'd rather play. You know, that said, now it'll probably go up ten, ten bucks tomorrow. Uh, TNH. Somebody's asking about. I, I think the fertilizers look okay. And I haven't looked at this one, but I'm guessing it looks okay. Yeah. I mean, kind of a big stall here. Did they come out with earnings last week? And so. It, yeah, they did. Earnings. Yeah, and then it comes right back. So you would, you know, if you bought it in here, you would have sold out here, and then it does this just to tick you off. Um, it's acting okay, but the, the fertilizers are a little vol uh, volatile. Uh, somebody says, FYI, the scuttlebutt is that there's no better outcome using DaVinci for prostrate uh, than traditional for SX. Is that a procedure in SX? 
the traditional approach, some recent articles in the medical literature. I would say um, maybe that is true, and maybe there are some questions. And of course, I think it's healthy that you know any device that's being used for surgery that isn't a human being should should be rigorously um, you know critiqued always. So it's good to see that there is discussion in the medical journals about these devices that they're using these days. But I think if there is a problem with it, you'll see it in the next volume action first. So. Uh, I know that there was somebody who told me that Jazz was a lousy company and that they were going to, you know, blow up. And that was back somewhere, you know, I don't know, in here when the stock was trading in the 20s. Of course, it ran up into the high 40s before it, well, let's say the low 50s now. So, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, what they were telling me at the time uh, that salespeople there were complaining about the fact that other, other companies with better drugs and that we're going to come on. I don't know. There's some, some big story and it's kind of convincing. But you know what? My view is it will show up in the uh, uh, price of volume action. What are some of the symptoms of a top? I know, well, symptoms of a top are leaders all all topping. You'll see a lot of leaders breaking down. You don't really see that. You see, even on days when the market's weak, you're seeing stocks gapping up and breaking out. Even though you have some that falter, you know, and the market goes through the process of weeding out the weak ones and the strong ones continue to survive. And so you want to be pulling out of your weaker stocks and into uh, your, your stronger stocks. But I don't think that necessarily means chasing things around and dumping things that are acting okay just because they're not moving on a particular day. Um, you know, but tops, Dr. K, is there a one-size-fits-all template for tops? Uh, yeah, not really. Um, you know, there's obviously lots of different topping formations, um, and the, the answer is beyond really the scope of this webinar, but we do talk about some of this uh, in our FAQs and also in the book. Yeah, so you could check there. Uh, a day trading forum would rock. I guess it would. I don't know. I don't ha have much luck day trading generally. Um, let's see. Somebody's asking about uh, SWI. Uh, is this a problem? Is what a problem? Something about heavy volume. Well, you can see here, I think when they announced earnings, the stock had already had a pocket pivot here, which we told you about. So it runs up, it breaks out, they announce earnings, it comes back down right on top of the breakout point, and the next day trades a lot more volume and moves higher. So now you're, you're just kissing the 10-day moving average. So what you're looking for now, if you are along the stock, uh, and I think it's a good example of how Stocks can have these one-day spin-outs, but as long as they find support somewhere and are able to hold constructively, that's fine. And if you go back and you study just about any big leading stock, during its run, you will find that there are two or three or four or five points where it has a real hairy pullback. And one of the standard rules we used to use at O'Neill was that a stock will have an 11 to 12 percent pullback on average at various points along its run. So. I can even remember CQ Microsystems in 1995. I bought it in the low 20s. It ran up to 49 and then pulled out back to 37.50, where I loaded up on the November 90 calls, or I'm sorry, November 50 calls, which the stock from there turned around and took off and was trading around 96 by November when those calls expired, making them worth uh, 46 bucks a piece when I bought them for a buck and a half. But that is an example of you know, how the stock can have a nice sharp pullback and still okay. Uh, CQ was a volatile name, so it had a bigger than normal move. 49 down to 37.50 is more like a 30% pullback. Uh, but I remember owning the stock, and because I had such a low cost basis at the time, I didn't really flinch. I was almost too dumb to be scared, if that makes any sense. You know, I was just sticking to the rules. Like, okay, now it's at the 50-day moving average at 37.50, and that's the first time it pulled back, so I'm going to buy the the crap out of it and it turns around and it goes to 90 something so uh, you know sometimes it's helpful to not know too much because uh, you scare yourself out of things but I think that in general you have to be uh, once you're up and out with the stock you got to give it some room and so you know if this breaks out for example and you have this hairy day it, is that something to be concerned about not not as one day no not at all in fact, something like that's normal, and you do need these from time to time because it scares people out and gets out the, the weenies, you know, like me, for example. If I already have a 50% position, what percent would be okay to add? Well, I don't know. It depends how much you want to own of it going into earnings tomorrow. So just remember, if, it, if you have a 50% position, and I'm guessing you can't be more than 10% up on that position, 
if the stock drops 10%, you're going to be down 5% in your total portfolio. So if you can live with that, that's fine. But like I said earlier, I think with Monster having already guided, uh, I don't think there are any, going to be any real surprises. Uh, they may show that they're maybe they're doing a little better. Um, so, you know, I don't know. You, you, Dr. K, can you answer that question? And here's the, the thing is, if I already have a 50% position, and this is based on uh, the pocket pivot today, what would be the proper amount to add? Well, I mean, it really, yeah, I mean, it always comes down to your risk tolerance level. You know, you have to ask right. yourself, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, loss can you withstand if, if, the, uh, if the worst occurs? Yeah, and that's really what it boils down to. You know, there's no one-size-fits-all answer. So if, if you've been on these webinars for a while, uh, you know that I abuse people prolifically if they in try to try to come up with a, or try to ask a question that is asking for some sort of one-size-fits-all absolute perfect uh, answer uh, to their problem. There's risk is inherent in the market. Uncertainty is inherent in the market. So if you have a 50% position, you're 10% up on it, and you get a new pocket pivot, I think you're probably already good in there already. So unless you're me and you're, you're a maniac, then you could add another 20%. But if that thing starts to falter, uh, you better be out of there quick if you've got a 70% position at that point. So it really depends on what you're willing to lose if it, if it fails on you. And that's really the bottom line. Um, I'm using O'Neill data on LinkedIn. Someone's asking about the float. O'Neill shows the float is 11 million. Uh, they do have uh, Treasury stock uh, and, and included with their flows 97 million shares outstanding. So I think all the calcs on their financials are based on the 97 million shares outstanding. They have a float of 11 million. Yahoo says 43 million. Um, I don't know. Who do you believe? So I do know. So let's see if I take uh, Dr. K. What's another good source here? Um. I would just Google. Let's see. Let me see if I can find something on this. But I'm using my O'Neill source uh, on that one. Let's see if I can use my see what high growth investor uh, software shows. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing one one source says 7.8 million and then 94 million shares outstanding. Right. Okay. So that's kind of close to the O'Neill source. O'Neill says uh, 97 million outstanding. Okay. I'm looking over here also. Um, Shares, shares outstanding. Okay, now see, uh, high growth stock investor shows 96 million shares outstanding, but a float of 96.43 million. I think there's an error there. I would say if you have two sources showing closer to the 11 million number and one not, and then one that I don't think really makes any sense, uh, I would. And there's a third source. There's a third source that also about um, is uh, equivalent to the O'Neill numbers. Yeah, but the the thing is, we're not buying LinkedIn on the basis of of the you know the huge short interest. I, I just think that it's uh, I just think that it, it's if everybody's out there saying short the stock, short the stock, I think you know you're going to squeeze them. And if there, there's already pretty good, if you've got eight million shares outstanding on this thing, I think that's pretty good uh, short interest. But that's not the main reason why we're buying it. Uh, maybe there isn't that much short interest relative to the float. You know, maybe that's the case. The, uh, yesterday, when it went through 95, you would have sque squeezed the shorts, or as some people like to say, the shorts would have been squozen. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm just going to go by the price volume action here, and, and it looks like it's a buy here. Please expound on The idea of determining too far extended based on ATR, I've never heard of that. Well, he just said that, you know, if it's the volatile stock and he and it could be 10%, so maybe, I think we already answered that question. Uh, let's see. Yeah, now I know several friends who become day traders. Some are saying that less than 16% of day traders ever make it long term, just the firms trading them. And we have friends who've tried that, and it doesn't work. I, even Ross uh, Haber tried doing it, and, and it just doesn't jive with an O'Neill way of looking at the market. We're trend followers. Um, <clears throat> let's see, anything else? What is, what is Dr. K's current account for distribution days on the market? 
Two. How many? Two. You got two. two. So you know you're not anywhere n near. Uh, well, you need you need to see to get to a cell signal. You got a long ways. Um. URI. Somebody keeps asking me a URI. Have I looked at it yet? United Rental. I don't know. I'm, I'm a, it's acting okay, but it doesn't throw me. So it's probably going to go a lot higher. You know, United Rentals. Rentals. Who cares about rentals? I guess these guys do pretty well with rentals, huh? So I don't know. It's building a little little flag here. So look for a pocket pivot. If you bought it down in here, you were smarter than I am. And uh, I would look for a pocket pivot to add here. And that's about it. Tango. Tango. Everybody loves this stock. What is Tango anyways? Cheap little thin thing. I don't know. Computer Software Special Enterprise. It's probably a cool company. It looks cool. Sounds cool. Got a great name. 80% growth. Good sponsorship. It's breaking out. Looks okay. I think it misses my radar because it only trades 285,000 shares a day. Very small. But good sponsorship. So it's a small small cap. If you got a small account, I guess you could try and play it. What do you think? Here, I'll give you guys. You guys are into this kind of stuff. How about this one? UBNT, Ubiquity Networks. Kind of looks like Tango, doesn't it? Smaller company. You can buy more shares. And it's acting okay. A little volatile. But, you know, Tango's a little bit like that, too. So, but smaller companies, interesting uh, stories. So, not too bad. Bought out their, uh, Oracle just bought out their competitor. Okay. Well, so why didn't Oracle buy them out? That's what I would ask. That must be bad for them. If Oracle bought their competitor, I guess Oracle didn't want them. Are you concerned about that? Anyways, I think that's about all we have. I mean, you can see the message we got here is we're just kind of trying to whittle into where the stronger names are. And uh, you can see names that have acted well, and some names have been a little sloppy. We tend to want to stay with our better moves, our better acting stocks, the more stable ones. You see the jazz kind of flipping out. Don't really care for that. Um, and other stocks that flip out, like save, you don't really care for that. On the other hand, the thing that we think has some of the strongest momentum right now are the precious metals, and that's pretty much where we are focused. Uh, and we'll probably stay focused there as long as they continue to issue uh, new buy points, which they have. And so, so far, those are pretty good. My bet is that the SLB is getting ready to overtake its 200-day moving average. So we'll just see how that goes over the next few days. And that's pretty much all we have. So I'd like to thank everyone for showing up. I hope you like this uh, time uh, segment. Dr. K, you can go to sleep now. It's 2 o'clock uh, there. I'm, I'm not going to sleep for another two hours at least. So. Oh, okay. Well, I'm it's, fine. You know, just no, so you know, it'll only, it'll only be 6 o'clock in my time. Just pretend it's you're back. What? Just pretend you're in L.A. It's only 6 o'clock. It'll be 6 o'clock in two hours. So, Anyways, everybody, thanks for showing up, and we'll catch you next time. Uh, watch for the, uh, the, the potentially new private blog that we're thinking about putting up for the webinar community that we have. And, and again, thanks for showing up. You guys will catch you next time. Take care. Take it easy. Bye-bye.